how are you? I feel that it would be a little unkind to present tonight's strange tale without just a word of friendly warning. Our story deals with the ancient belief in evil spirits that haunt the living and ophidophobia, the fear of snakes. Due to the gory nature of this story, I would advise this audio oddity be censored from the ears of small children and the cognitively challenged. Oh, and another thing, if tonight's nauseating narrative makes your breathing become fast and shallow, you experience dry mouth, your palms become cold, clammy, and your body sweaty, particularly in the underarm area, then you would be well advised to stop listening. It's such a horrible story that you might even experience a distressing loss of bladder or bowel control. What I'm trying to say is that this is not a bedtime story for everybody. Now that you're prepared, let's commence the audio atrocity I call The Curse of Yig. In 1925, I went into Oklahoma looking for snake lore. I came out with a fear of snakes that will last me the rest of my life. I admit it is foolish since there are natural explanations for everything I saw and heard, but it masters me nonetheless. If the old story had been all there was to it, I would not have been so badly shaken. My work as an American Indian ethnologist has hardened me to all kinds of extravagant legendary and I know that simple white people can beat the Indians at their own game when it comes to fanciful inventions. But I can't forget what I saw with my own eyes at the insane asylum in Guthrie. I called at that asylum because a few of the oldest settlers told me I would find something important there. Neither Indians nor white men would discuss the snake god legends I had come to trace. The oil boom newcomers, of course, knew nothing of such matters, and the red men and old pioneers were plainly frightened when I spoke of them. Not more than six or seven people mentioned the asylum, and those who did were careful to talk in whispers. But the whisperers said that Dr. McNeil could show me a very terrible relic and tell me all I wanted to know. He could explain why Yig, the half-human father of serpents, is a shunned and feared object in central Oklahoma, and why old settlers shiver at the secret Indian orgies which make the autumn days and nights hideous with the ceaseless beating of tom-toms in lonely places. It was with the scent of a hound on the trail that I went to Guthrie, for I had spent many years collecting data on the evolution of serpent worship among the Indians. I had always felt, from well-defined undertones of legend and archaeology, that great Quetzalcoatl, benign snake god of the Mexicans, had had an older and darker prototype, and during recent months I had well-nigh proved it in a series of researches stretching from Guatemala to the Oklahoma Plains. But everything was tantalizingly incomplete, for above the border the cult of the snake was hedged about by fear and furtiveness. Now it appeared that a new and copious source of data was about to dawn, and I sought the head of the asylum with an eagerness I did not try to cloak. Dr. McNeil was a small, clean-shaven man of somewhat advanced years, and I saw at once from his speech and manner that he was a scholar of no mean attainments in many branches outside his profession, grave and doubtful when I first made known my errand. His face grew thoughtful as he carefully scanned my credentials and the letter of introduction which a kindly old ex-Indian agent had given me. So you've been studying the Yig legend, eh? He reflected sententiously. I know that many of our Oklahoma ethnologists have tried to connect it with Quetzalcoatl, but I don't think any of them have traced the intermediate steps so well. You've done remarkable work for a man as young as you seem to be, and you certainly deserve all the data we can give. I don't suppose old Major Moore or any of the others told you what it is I have here. They don't like to talk about it, and neither do I. It is very tragic and very horrible, but that is all. I refuse to consider it anything supernatural. There's a story about it that I'll tell you after you see it. 
devilish sad story, but one that I won't call magic. It merely shows the potency that belief has over some people. I'll admit there are times when I feel a shiver that's more than physical. But in daylight I set all that down to nerves. I'm not a young fellow any more, alas. To come to the point, the thing I have here is what you might call a victim of Yig's curse. A physically living victim. We don't let the bulk of the nurses see it, although most of them know it's here. There are just two steady old chaps whom I let feed it and clean out its quarters. Used to be three, but good old Stevens passed on a few years ago. I suppose I'll have to break in a new group pretty soon, for the thing does not seem to age or change much. And we old boys can't last forever. Maybe the ethics of the near future will let us give it a merciless release, but it's hard to tell. Did you see that single ground-glass basement window over in the east wing when you came up the drive? That's where it is. I'll take you there myself now. You needn't make any comment. Just look through the movable panel in the door and thank God the light isn't any stronger. Then I'll give you the story, or as much as I've been able to piece together. We walk downstairs very quietly, and did not talk as we threaded the corridors of the seemingly deserted basement. Dr. McNeil unlocked a gray-painted steel door, but it was only a bulkhead leading to a further stretch of hallway. At length, he paused before a door marked B-116, opened a small observation panel which he could use only by standing on tiptoe, and pounded several times upon the painted metal, as if to arouse the occupant. Whatever it might be, a faint stench came from the aperture as the doctor unclosed it, and I fancied his pounding elicited a kind of low, hissing response. Finally he motioned me to replace him at the peephole, and I did so with a causeless and increasing tremor. The barred ground-glass window close to the earth outside admitted only a feeble and uncertain pallor, and I had to look into the malodorous den for several seconds before I could see what was crawling and wriggling about on the straw-covered floor, emitting every now and then a weak and vacuous hiss. Then the shadowed outlines began to take shape, and I perceived that the squirming entity bore some remote resemblance to a human form laid flat on its belly. I clutched at the door-handle for support as I tried to keep from fainting. The moving object was almost of human size— and entirely devoid of clothing. It was absolutely hairless, and its tawny-looking back seemed subtly squamous in the dim, ghoulish light. Around the shoulders it was rather speckled and brownish, and the head was very curiously flat. It looked up to hiss at me, and I saw that the beady little black eyes were damnably anthropoid, but I could not bear to study them long. They fastened themselves on me with a horrible persistence so that I closed the panel gaspingly and left the creature to wriggle about unseen in its matted straw and spectral twilight. I must have reeled a bit, for I saw that the doctor was gently holding my arm as he guided me away. I was stuttering over and over again, but, but for God's sake, what is it? Dr. McNeil told me the story in his private office as I sprawled opposite him in an easy chair. The gold and crimson of late afternoon changed to the violet of early dusk, but still I sat awed and motionless. I resented every ring of the telephone and every whir of the buzzer, and I could have cursed the nurses and interns whose knocks now and then summoned the doctor briefly to the outer office. Night came, and I was glad my host switched on all the lights. Scientist though I was, my zeal for research was half forgotten amid such breathless ecstasies of fright as a small boy might feel when whispered witch tales go the rounds of the chimney corner. It seems that Yig, the snake god of the Central Plains tribes, presumably the primal source of the more southerly Quetzalcoatlucuco clan, was an odd, half anthropomorphic devil of highly arbitrary and capricious nature. He was not wholly evil and was usually quite well disposed towards those who gave proper respect to him and his children, the serpents. But in the autumn he became abnormally ravenous and had to be driven away by means of suitable rites. 
That was why the Tom-Toms in the Pawnee, Wichita, and Caddo country pounded ceaselessly, week in and week out in August, September, and October, and why the medicine men made strange noises with rattles and whistles, curiously like those of the Aztecs and the Mayas. Yig's chief trait was a relentless devotion to his children, a devotion so great that the Redskins almost feared to protect themselves from the venomous rattlesnakes which thronged the region. Frightful clandestine tales hinted of his vengeance upon mortals who flouted him or wreaked harm upon his wriggling progeny, his chosen method being to turn his victim, after suitable tortures, to a spotted snake. In the old days of the Indian Territory, the doctor went on, there was not quite so much secrecy about Yig. The Plains tribes, less cautious than the desert nomads and pueblos, talked quite freely of their legends and autumn ceremonies with the first Indian agents, and let considerable of the lore spread out through the neighboring regions of white settlement. The great fear came in the land rush days of '89 when some extraordinary incidents had been rumored, and the rumors sustained by what seemed to be hideously tangible proofs. Indians said that the new white men did not know how to get on with Yig, and afterward the settlers came to take that theory at face value. Now no old-timer in middle Oklahoma, white or red, could be induced to breathe a word about the snake god, except in vague hints. Yet after all, the doctor added with almost needless emphasis, the only truly authenticated horror had been a thing of pitiful tragedy rather than of bewitchment. It was all very material and cruel, even that last phase which had caused so much dispute. Dr. McNeil paused and cleared his throat before getting down to his special story, and I felt a tingling sensation as when a theater curtain rises. The thing had begun when Walker Davis and his wife Audrey left Arkansas to settle in the newly opened public lands in the spring of 1889, and the end had come in the country of the Wichitas, north of the Wichita River, in what is at present Caddo County. There's a small village called Binger there now, and the railway goes through, but otherwise the place is less changed than other parts of Oklahoma. It is still a section of farms and ranches, quite productive in these days, since the great oil fields do not come very close. Walker and Audrey had come from Franklin County in the Ozarks with a canvas-topped wagon, two mules, an ancient and useless dog called Wolf, and all their household goods. They were typical hill folk, youngish, and rather a little more ambitious than most, and looked forward to a life of better returns for their hard work than they had had in Arkansas. Both were lean, raw-boned specimens, the man tall, sandy, and gray-eyed, and the woman short and rather dark, with a black straightness of hair suggesting a slight Indian admixture. In general, there was very little of distinction about them, and but for one thing their annals might not have differed from those of thousands of other pioneers who flocked into the new country at that time. That thing was Walker's almost epileptic fear of snakes, which some laid to prenatal causes, and some said came from a dark prophecy about his end with which an old Indian squaw had tried to scare him when he was small. Whatever the cause, the effect was marked indeed, for despite his strong general courage, the very mention of a snake would cause him to grow faint and pale, while the sight of even a tiny specimen would produce a shock sometimes bordering on a convulsion seizure. The Davises started out early in the year, in the hope of being on their new land for the spring plowing. Travel was slow, for the roads were bad in Arkansas, while in the territory there were great stretches of rolling hills and red, sandy barrens without any roads whatsoever. As the terrain grew flatter, the change from their native mountains depressed them more, perhaps, than they realized, but they found the people at the Indian agencies very affable, while most of the settled Indians seemed friendly and civil. Now and then they encountered a fellow pioneer, with whom crude pleasantries and expressions of amiable rivalry were generally exchanged. Owing to the season, there were not many snakes in evidence, so Walker did not suffer from his special temperamental weakness. In the earlier stages of the journey, too, there were no Indian snake legends to trouble him. 
for the transplanted tribes from the southeast do not share the wilder beliefs of their western neighbors. As fate would have it, it was a white man at Okmalgi in the creek country who gave the Davises the first hint of the Yig beliefs, a hint which had a curiously fascinating effect on Walker and caused him to ask questions very freely after that. Before long, Walker's fascination had developed into a bad case of fright. He took the most extraordinary precautions at each of the nightly camps, always clearing away whatever vegetation he found and avoiding stony places wherever he could. Every clump of stunted bushes and every cleft in the great slab-like rocks seemed to him now to hide malevolent serpents, while every human figure, not obviously part of a settlement or emigrant train, seemed to him a potential snake god, till nearness had proved the contrary. Fortunately, no troublesome encounters came at this stage to shake his nerves still further. As they approached the Kickapoo country, they found it harder and harder to avoid camping near rocks. Finally, it was no longer possible, and poor Walker was reduced to the puerile expedient of droning some of the rustic anti-snake charms he had learned in his boyhood. Two or three times a snake was really glimpsed, and these sights did not help the sufferer in his efforts to preserve composure. On the twenty-second evening of the journey, a savage wind made it imperative, for the sake of the mules, to camp in as sheltered a spot as possible, and Audrey persuaded her husband to take advantage of a cliff which rose uncommonly high above the dried bed of a former tributary of the Canadian River. He did not like the rocky cast of the place, but allowed himself to be overruled this once leading the animals sullenly toward the protecting slope which the nature of the ground would not allow the wagon to approach. Audrey, examining the rocks near the wagon, meanwhile noticed a singular sniffing on the part of the feeble old dog. Seizing a rifle, she followed his lead, and presently thanked her stars that she had forestalled Walker in her discovery, for there, snugly nested in the gap between two boulders, was a sight it would have done him no good to see, visible only as one convoluted expanse, but perhaps comprising as many as three or four separate units with a mass of lazy wriggling, which could not be other than a brood of newborn rattlesnakes. Anxious to save Walker from a trying shock, Audrey did not hesitate to act, but took the gun firmly by the barrel and brought the butt down again and again upon the writhing objects. Her own sense of loathing was great, but it did not amount to a real fear. Finally she saw that her task was done, and turned to cleanse the improvised bludgeon in the red sand and dry dead grass nearby. She must, she reflected, cover the nest up before Walker got back from tethering the mules. Old Wolf, tottering relic of mixed shepherd and coyote ancestry that he was, had vanished, and she feared he had gone to fetch his master. Footsteps at that instant proved her fear well-founded. A second more, and Walker had seen everything. Audrey made a move to catch him if he should faint, but he did no more than sway. Then the look of pure fright on his bloodless face turned slowly to something like mingled awe and anger, and he began to upbraid his wife in trembling tones. "'God's sake, Odd, but why'd you go for to do that? Ain't you heard all the things they've been a-telling about this snake-devil yig? You'd ought to have told me it would have moved on. Don't you know there's a devil god what gets even if you hurts his children? What for do you think the Injuns all dances and beats their drums in the fall about? This land's under a curse, I can tell you. Nigh every soul we've a talked to since we come in said the same. Yig rules here, and he comes out every fall for to get his victims and turn them into snakes. Why, odd, they won't none of them Injuns cross the Canadian kill a snake for love nor money. God knows what you've done to yourself, gal, a stomping out a whole brood of Yig's children. He'll get you sure, sooner or later, unless and I can buy a charm off in some of the Injun medicine men. He'll get you odd, as sure as there's a God in heaven. He'll come out in the night and turn you into a crawling, spotted snake. All the rest of the journey, Walker kept up the frightened reproofs and prophecies. 
They crossed the Canadian near Newcastle, and soon afterward met with the first of the real Plains Indians they had seen, a party of blanketed Wichitas, whose leader talked freely under the spell of the whiskey offered him, and taught poor Walker a long-winded protective charm against Yig in exchange for a quart bottle of the same inspiring fluid. By the end of the week the chosen site in the Wichita country was reached, and the Davises made haste to trace their boundaries and perform the spring plowing before even beginning the construction of a cabin. The region was flat, drearily windy, and sparse of natural vegetation, but promised great fertility under cultivation. Occasional outcroppings of granite diversified a soil of decomposed red sandstone, and here and there a great flat rock would stretch along the surface of the ground like a man-made floor. There seemed to be very few snakes or possible dens for them, so Audrey at last persuaded Walker to build the one-room cabin over a vast, smooth slab of exposed stone. With such a flooring, and with a good-sized fireplace, the wettest weather might be defied though it soon became evident that dampness was no salient quality of the district. Logs were hauled in the wagon from the nearest belt of woods, many miles toward the Wichita Mountains. Walker built his wide-chimneyed cabin and crude barn with the aid of the other settlers, though the nearest one was over a mile away. In turn, he helped his helpers at similar house raisings, so that many ties of friendship sprang up between the new neighbors. There was no town worthy of the name nearer than El Reno, on the railway thirty miles or more to the northeast, and before many weeks had passed, the people of the section had become very cohesive despite the wideness of their scattering. The Indians, a few of whom had begun to settle down on ranches, were for the most part harmless, though somewhat quarrelsome when fired by the liquid stimulation which found its way to them despite all government bans. Of all the neighbors, the Davises found Joe and Sally Compton, who likewise hailed from Arkansas, the most helpful and congenial. Sally is still alive, known now as Grandma Compton, and her son Clyde, then an infant in arms, has become one of the leading men of the state. Sally and Audrey used to visit each other often, for their cabins were only two miles apart, and in the long spring and summer afternoons they exchanged many a tale of old Arkansas and many a rumor about the new country. Sally was very sympathetic about Walker's weakness regarding snakes, but perhaps did more to aggravate than cure the parallel nervousness which Audrey was acquiring through his incessant praying and prophesying about the curse of Yig. She was uncommonly full of gruesome snake stories, and produced a direfully strong impression with her acknowledged masterpiece, the tale of a man in Scott County, who had been bitten by a whole horde of rattlers at once, and had swelled so monstrously from poison that his body had finally burst with a pop. Needless to say, Audrey did not repeat this anecdote to her husband, and she implored the Comptons to beware of starting it on the grounds of the countryside. It is to Joe and Sally's credit that they heeded this plea with the utmost fidelity. Walker did his corn planting early and in midsummer improved his time by harvesting a fair crop of the native grass of the region. With the help of Joe Compton, he dug a well which gave a moderate supply of very good water, though he planned to sink an artesian later on. Every now and then he rode over to the cluster of thatched conical huts which formed the main village of the Wichitas, and talked long with the old men and shamans about the snake god and how to nullify his wrath. Charms were always ready in exchange for whiskey. But much of the information he got was far from reassuring. Yig was a great god. He was bad medicine. He did not forget things. In the autumn his children were hungry and wild, and Yig was hungry and wild too. All the tribes made medicine against Yig when the corn harvest came. They gave him some corn, and danced in proper regalia to the sound of whistle, rattle, and drum. They kept the drums pounding to drive Yig away, and called down the aid of Tirwa, whose children men are, even as the snakes are Yig's children. It was bad that the squaw of Davis killed the children of Yig. Let Davis say the charms many times when the corn harvest comes. Yig is Yig. Yig is a great god. By the time the corn harvest did come, 
Walker had succeeded in getting his wife into a deplorably jumpy state. His prayers and borrowed incantations came to be a nuisance, and when the autumn rites of the Indians began, there was always a distant, wind-borne pounding of tom-toms to lend an added background of the sinister. It was maddening to have the muffled clatter always stealing over the wide red plains. Why would it never stop? Day and night, week on week, it was always going, in exhaustless relays, as persistently as the red dusty winds that carried it. Audrey loathed it more than her husband did, for he saw in it a compensating element of protection. It was with this sense of a mighty, intangible bulwark against evil that he got in his corn crop and prepared cabin and stable for the coming winter. The autumn was abnormally warm and except for their primitive cookery, the Davises found scant use for the stone fireplace Walker had built with such care. Something in the unnaturalness of the hot dust clouds preyed on the nerves of all the settlers, but most of all on Audrey's and Walker's. The notions of a hovering snake curse and the weird, endless rhythm of the distant Indian drums formed a bad combination, which any added element of the bazaar went far to render utterly unendurable. Notwithstanding this strain, several festive gatherings were held at one or another of the cabins after the crops were reaped, keeping naively alive in modernity those curious rites of the harvest home, which are as old as human agriculture itself. Lafayette Smith, who came from southern Missouri and had a cabin about three miles east of the Walkers, was a very passable fiddler and his tunes did much to make the celebrants forget the monotonous beating of the distant tom-toms. Then Halloween drew near, and the settlers planned another frolic, this time, had they but known it, of a lineage older than even agriculture, the dread witch-sabbath of the primal pre-Aryans, kept alive through ages in the midnight blackness of secret woods, and still hinting at vague terrors under its latter-day mask of comedy and lightness. Halloween was to fall on a Thursday, and the neighbors agreed to gather for their first revel at the Davis's cabin. It was on that 31st of October that the warm spell broke. The morning was gray and leaden, and by noon the incessant winds had changed from searingness to rawness. People shivered all the more because they were not prepared for the chill, and Walker and Davis's old dog, Wolf, dragged himself wearily indoors to a place beside the hearth. But the distant drums still thumped on, nor were the white citizenry less inclined to pursue their chosen rites. As early as four in the afternoon the wagons began to arrive at Walker's cabin, and in the evening, after a memorable barbecue, Lafayette Smith's fiddle inspired a very fair-sized company to great feats of saltatory grotesqueness in the one good-sized but crowded room. The younger folk indulged in the amiable inanities proper to the season. And now and then old Wolf would howl with doleful and spine-tickling ominous at some especially spectral strain from Lafayette's squeaky violin, a device he had never heard before. Mostly, though, this battered veteran slept through the merriment, for he was past the age of active interests and lived largely in his dreams. Tom and Jenny Rigby had brought their collie Zeke along, but the canines did not fraternize. Zeke seemed strangely uneasy over something and nosed around curiously all the evening. Audrey and Walker made a fine couple on the floor, and Grandma Compton still likes to recall her impression of their dancing that night. Their worries seemed forgotten for the nonce, and Walker was shaved and trimmed into a surprising degree of spruceness. By ten o'clock all hands were healthily tired, and the guests began to depart family by family with many handshakings and bluff assurances of what a fine time everybody had had. Tom and Jenny thought Zeke's eerie howls as he followed them to their wagon were marks of regret at having to go home, though Audrey said it must be the faraway tom-toms which annoyed him, for the distant thumping was surely ghastly enough after the merriment within. The night was bitterly cold, and for the first time Walker put a great log in the fireplace and banked it with ashes to keep it smoldering till morning. Old Wolf dragged himself within the ruddy glow and lapsed into his customary coma. Audrey and Walker, too tired to think of charms or curses, 
tumbled into the rough pine bed and were asleep before the cheap alarm clock on the mantel had ticked out three minutes. And from far away, the rhythmic pounding of those hellish tom-toms still pulsed on the chill night wind. Dr. McNeil paused here and removed his glasses, as if a blurring of the objective world might make the reminiscent vision clearer. You'll soon appreciate, he said, that I had a great deal of difficulty in piecing out all that happened after the guests left. There were times, though, at first, when I was able to make a try at it. After a moment of silence, he went on with the tale. Audrey had terrible dreams of Yig, who appeared to her in the guise of Satan, as depicted in cheap engravings she had seen. It was, indeed, from an absolute ecstasy of nightmare that she started suddenly awake to find Walker already conscious and sitting up in bed. He seemed to be listening intently to something, and silenced her with a whisper when she began to ask what had aroused him. Hark, Odd, he breathed. Don't you hear something a singing and a buzzing and a rustling? Do you reckon it's the fall crickets? Certainly. There was distinctly audible within the cabin such a sound as he had described. Audrey tried to analyze it and was impressed with some element at once horrible and familiar which hovered just outside the rim of her memory. And beyond it all, waking a hideous thought, the monotonous beating of the distant tom-toms came incessantly across the black plains on which a cloudy half-moon had set. Walker, suppose it's th th the curse of Yick. She could feel him tremble. No, gal, I, I don't reckon he comes that way. He's shaping like a man, except you look at him close. That's what Chief Grey Eagle says. This here's some varmints come in out in the cold. Uh, not crickets, I calculate, but somewhat like them. Uh, I ought to get up and stomp them out before they make much headway or get at the cupboard. He rose, felt for the lantern that hung within easy reach, and rattled the tin matchbox nailed to the wall beside it. Audrey sat up in bed and watched the flare of the match grow into the steady glow of the lantern. Then... As their eyes began to take in the whole of the room, the crude rafters shook with the frenzy of their simultaneous shriek, for the flat, rocky floor revealed in the newborn illumination was one seething, brown-speckled mass of wriggling rattlesnakes, slithering toward the fire, and even now turning their loathsome heads to menace the fright-blasted lantern-bearer. It was only for an instant that Audrey saw the things. The reptiles were of every size, of unaccountable numbers, and apparently of several varieties, and even as she looked, two or three of them reared their heads as if to strike at Walker. She did not faint. It was Walker's crash to the floor that extinguished the lantern and plunged her into blackness. He had not screamed a second time. Fright had paralyzed him, and he fell as if shot by a silent arrow from no mortal's bow. To Audrey, the entire world seemed to whirl about fantastically, mingling with the nightmare from which she had started. Voluntary motion of any sort was impossible, for will and the sense of reality had left her. She fell back inertly on her pillow, hoping that she would wake soon. No actual sense of what had happened penetrated her mind for some time. Then, little by little, the suspicion that she was really awake began to dawn on her and she was convulsed with a mounting blend of panic and grief which made her long to shriek out despite the inhibiting spell which kept her mute. Walker was gone, and she had not been able to help him. He had died of snakes, just as the old witch-woman had predicted when he was a little boy. Poor Wolf had not been able to help either. Probably he had not even awakened from his senile stupor, and now the crawling things must be coming for her, writhing closer and closer every moment in the dark, perhaps even now twining slipperily about the bedposts and oozing up over the coarse woolen blankets. Unconsciously she crept under the clothes and trembled. It must be the curse of Yig. He had sent his monstrous children on all Hallows' night, 
and they had taken Walker first. Why was that? Wasn't he innocent enough? Why not come straight for her? Hadn't she killed the little rattlers alone? Then she thought of the curse's form as told by the Indians. She wouldn't be killed, just turned into a spotted snake. <laughs> So she would be like those things she had glimpsed on the floor. Those things which Yig had sent to get her and enroll her among their number. She tried to mumble a charm that Walker had taught her, but found she could not utter a single sound. The noisy ticking of the alarm clock sounded above the maddening beat of the distant tom-toms. The snakes were taking a long time. Did they mean to delay on purpose to play on her nerves? Every now and then she thought she felt a steady, insidious presence on the bedclothes, but each time it turned out to be only the automatic twitchings of her overwrought nerves. Those snakes couldn't have taken so long. They couldn't be Yig's messengers after all, but just natural rattlers that were nested below the rock and had been drawn there by the fire. They weren't coming for her, perhaps. Perhaps they had sated themselves on poor Walker. Where were they now? Gone? Coiled by the fire? Still crawling over the prone corpse of their victim? The clock ticked and the distant drums throbbed on. At the thought of her husband's body lying there, in the pitch blackness a thrill of purely physical horror passed over Audrey. That story of Sally Compton's about the man back in Scott County. He, too, had been bitten by a whole bunch of rattlesnakes, and what had happened to him? The poison had rotted the flesh and swelled the whole corpse, and in the end the bloated thing had burst horribly, burst horribly, with a detestable popping noise. Was that what was happening to Walker down there on the rock floor? Instinctively she felt that she had begun to listen for something too terrible even to name to herself— the clock ticked on, keeping a kind of mocking, sardonic time with the far-off drumming that the night wind brought. She wished it were a striking clock so that she could know how long this eldritch vigil must last. She cursed the toughness of fiber that kept her from fainting and wondered what sort of relief the dawn could bring after all. Probably neighbors would pass. No doubt somebody would call. Would they find her still sane? Was she still sane now? Morbidly listening, Audrey all at once became aware of something which she had to verify with every effort of her will before she could believe it, and which, once verified, she did not know whether to welcome or dread. The distant beating of the Indian tom-toms had ceased. She did not relish this new and sudden silence, after all. There was something sinister about it. The loud ticking clock seemed abnormal in its new loneliness, capable at last of conscious motion. She shook the covers from her face and looked into the darkness toward the window. It must have cleared after the moon set, for she saw the square aperture distinctly against the background of stars. Then without warning came that shocking, unutterable sound. <laughs> Ah, that dull pop of cleft skin and escaping poison in the dark. God! The bonds of muteness snapped, and the black night waxed reverberant with Audrey's screams of stark, unbridled frenzy. Consciousness did not pass away with the shock. How merciful if only it had! Amidst the echoes of her shrieking, Audrey still saw the star-sprinkled square of window ahead and heard the doom-boding ticking of that frightful clock. Did she hear another sound? Was that square window still a perfect square? She was in no condition to weigh the evidence of her senses or distinguish between fact and hallucination. No, that window was not a perfect square. Something had encroached on the lower edge. Nor was the ticking of the clock the only sound in the room. There was, beyond dispute, a heavy breathing. Neither her own, nor poor Wolf's. Wolf slept very silently, 
and his wakeful wheezing was unmistakable. Then Audrey saw against the stars the black, demonic silhouette of something anthropoid, the undulant bulk of a gigantic head and shoulders fumbling slowly toward her. <coughs> <laughs> go away, go away, go away, snake devil, go away, Yig. I didn't mean to kill him. I was afraid he'd be scared of him. Don't, Yig, don't. I didn't go for to hurt you, chillin'. Don't come near me. Don't change me into no spotted snake. But the half-formless head and shoulders only lurched onward toward the bed, very silently, Everything snapped at once inside Audrey's head, and in a second she had turned from a cowering child to a raging madwoman. She knew where the axe was. Hung against the wall on those pegs near the lantern, it was within easy reach, and she could find it in the dark. Before she was conscious of anything further, it was in her hands, and she was creeping toward the foot of the bed, toward the monstrous head and shoulders that every moment groped their way nearer. Had there been any light, the look on her face would not have been pleasant to see. Take that, you, and that, and that, and that. She was laughing shrilly now, and her cackles mounted higher as she saw that the starlight beyond the window was yielding to the dim prophetic pallor of the coming dawn. Dr. McNeil wiped the perspiration from his forehead and put on his glasses again. I waited for him to resume, and as he kept silent, I spoke softly. She lived? Was she found? Was it ever explained? The doctor cleared his throat. Yes. She lived, in a way. And it was explained. I told you there was no bewitchment, only cruel, pitiful, material horror. It was Sally Compton who had made the discovery. She had ridden over to the Davises' cabin the next afternoon to talk over the party with Audrey, and had seen no smoke from the chimney. That was queer. It turned very warm again, yet Audrey was usually cooking something at that hour. The mules were making hungry-sounding noises in the barn, and there was no sign of old Wolf sunning himself in the accustomed spot by the door. Altogether, Sally did not like the look of the place. So it was very timid and hesitant as she dismounted and knocked. She got no answer, but waited some time before trying the crude door of split logs. The lock, it appeared, was unfastened, and she slowly pushed her way in. Then, perceiving what was there, she reeled back, gasped, and clung to the jam to preserve her balance. A terrible odor had welled out as she opened the door, but that was not what had stunned her. It was what she had seen, for within that shadowy cabin monstrous things had happened, and three shocking objects remained on the floor to awe and baffle the beholder. Near the burnt-out fireplace was the great dog, purple decay on the skin left bare by mange and old age, and the whole carcass burst by the puffing effect of rattlesnake poison. It must have been bitten by a veritable legion of the reptiles. To the right of the door was the axe-hacked remnant of what had been a man, clad in a nightshirt and with the shattered bulk of a lantern clutched in one hand. He was totally free from any sign of snake-bite. Near him lay the ensanguined axe, carelessly discarded, and wriggling flat on the floor, was a loathsome, vacant-eyed thing that had been a woman, but was now only a mute, mad caricature. All that this thing could do was to hiss and hiss and hiss. Both the doctor and I were brushing cold drops from our foreheads by this time. He poured something from a flask on his desk, took a nip, and handed another glass to me. I could only suggest tremulously and stupidly. So Walker had only fainted that first time. The screams roused him, and the axe did the rest. Yes, 
Dr. McNeil's voice was low, but he met his death from snakes just the same. It was his fear working in two ways. It made him faint, and it made him fill his wife with the wild stories that caused her to strike out when she thought she saw the snake devil. I thought for a moment. And Audrey, wasn't it queer how the curse of Yig seemed to work itself out on her? I, I suppose the impression of hissing snakes had been fairly ground into her. Yes, there were lucid spells at first, but they got to be fewer and fewer. Her hair came white at the roots as it grew, and later began to fall out. The skin grew blotchy. And when she died, I interrupted with a start. Died? Then what was that, that thing downstairs? Dr. McNeil spoke gravely. That is what was born to her three quarters of a year afterwards. There were three more of them. Two were even worse. But this is the only one that lived. The Curse of Yig. Written by Z.B. Bishop. Narrated by Edward E. French. The Curse of Yig, written by Z.B. Bishop, narrated by Edward E. French, is copyright 2020. All rights reserved. To direct inquiries regarding this recording to Edward E. French at email edwardfrench06 at hotmail.com. Horror is nothing new. During Elizabethan times, crowds flocked to the Globe Theatre to see Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus, an orgy of blood, gore, and sadism. It was big B.O., as they say in the trades, big box office. Although most agreed that the bard dropped the ball on his next one. I still know what Titus Andronicus did last midsummer. Thank you, as ever, for listening. I'll be back next week with another story. Till then... Live simply, love deeply, play your lute and offer your honey. <laughs>